the focus of this lecture is genetics. It will proceed with a bit of history about genetics as a reminder of a past history tainted by genetics programs which were egregious violations of human dignity. And it will then describe modern efforts at genetics under the topics of genetic engineering, genetic enhancement, genetic testing, and genetic screening. The desire to improve the quality of the human race and or the quality of individual offspring is a perennial theme in human history. Plato's Republic, one of the earliest utopian works in Western philosophy, proposed selective breeding by arranging for the mating of the best men and the best women at the prime of their lives and in the most propitious seasons of the year for the good of the politeia. There was to be no marriage and no family for these superior citizens, just coupling for the purpose of producing the best offspring for the city-state. The term eugenics was coined by Francis Galton in Hereditary Genius, his first major work which appeared in 1869. In that work, Galton concerned about the possibility that the human species was in the process of degenerating and informed by his own research on inheritance, advocated a system of arranged marriages between carefully selected men and women for the purpose of breeding to improve the British race. Inferior human beings were to be prevented or, to, or were discouraged from reproducing. The term eugenics, eugenics itself from the Greek simply means well-born and it connotes a sense of contributing to or improving the stock or the race of a nation. The term became one of some suspicion when, when the goal of genetics was embraced by various political regimes and enforced through the state's coercive power as an effective instrument for social engineering. In modern times, the first extended program in, in state-sponsored eugenics programs were those developed in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. These eugenics programs grew from a constellation of ideas derived from evolutionary theory, which embraced social Darwinism, also from contemporaneous criminology encouraged by a scientific hypothesis supported by post-mortem examination of brains of criminals, and from the findings of the famous Jukes report on inheritance and criminal behavior, from the findings of demographic cons uh, concerns about dysgenics, the growth of criminal population, and the growth of the feeble-minded population because of their unrestrained breeding patterns, and finally from surgical advances such as vasectomy and salpingectomy in the practice of medicine. Involuntary sterilization became the instrument of this modern attempt at eugenics. The idea of genetic sterilization, the pursuit of this end as a national goal, and the procurement of means to attain this desired result was pressed by some of the most influential families, by some of the most prestigious societies and foundations, by some of the most powerful lawyers, judges, scientists, and physicians, and by some of the most elite universities in the United States. This central, this central notion, the clearest articulation of the goals of this movement, are to be found and recorded in the words of Mr. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who found involuntary sterilization to be compatible with the guarantees found in the United States Constitution. Holmes wrote this, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for lesser sacrifices, often not felt as such by those concerned, in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerative offspring for crime, or let them starve for their own imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover the cutting of the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles is enough. These eugenics programs in the United States exercised considerable influence 
on programs in other, in other nations, a particularly noxious combination of scientism, utopianism, and millenarianism, along with German Nordic mythology supported by the legitimating influences of practice and ideology imported from the United States and empowered by a dictatorship spawned the eugenic excesses of the Third Reich. The Nazis began with, with programs which encouraged healthy families and which restructured tax laws that favored child rearing, both benign in themselves and a small beginning of a program. However, these programs were soon followed by what were considered complementary laws, those enacted to prevent the production of defective human beings. Then the notion of defect was broadened from those with phys physical defects and illnesses refractive of treatment to debility associated with old age and to the defect of being non-German. It is estimated between the years of 1933 and 1945 through the agency of the Nazi hereditary health courts, 3,500,000 people were sterilized, most for no legitimate medical reason. Eugenic sterilization, including non-voluntary genetic sterilization in the United States, reached its apogee in the 1930s and continued until 1973. It has been reported that between the years 1907 and 1963, there were eugenic sterilization programs in 30 states, and in those programs combined, more than 60,000 people were sterilized. It is interesting to note that the eugenic sterilization programs in the United States continued even after the Nuremberg trial and the articulation of its code. It was not until 1973 that the debate over eugenic non-voluntary sterilization became a public debate in the United States. What forced the public debate was the public disclosure of the sterilization of young, poor African-American women and even some little girls in a family planning clinic located in Alabama and funded by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And the public disclosure of the programs of routine sterilization of retarded men institutionalized as wards of the state. In 1978, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare put into place a set of rigorous guidelines to protect minors and mentally incompetent persons from sterilization and to protect with an elaborate consent mechanism those competent persons who are dependent on public funds from coercive sterilization. Now, while forced sterilization is no longer a respectable means to accomplish eugenic vision, at least not in developed and developing free nations, the eugenic vision continues. Advances in science, including the unraveling of the DNA structure of the human gene, the mapping of the human genome, and the development of technologies that allow the alteration of human genes present amazing opportunities for humanity. As with all new knowledge and technologies, there are also possibilities for misuse in the violation of human dignity, in the violation of human rights, and in the violation of the ordered good of society. Eugenics now has at, as its disposal the sophisticated tools of genetic engineering, whose possibilities seem endless once the human genome map is completed in the understanding of the function and the interaction of the genes. The anatomy of the human genome will provide a new basis for biological study, such as evolution, and comparative anatomy, and will provide a new medical model for application in medical treatment. There are four types of genetic engineering. They are, in order of medical and scientific implication and ethical seriousness, designated types one, two, three, and four. Type one is somatic cell gene therapy. Type two is germ cell gene therapy. Type three is somatic cell gene enhancement, and type four is germ cell gene enhancement. Type one is therapeutic genetic engineering and is directed to the cure and prevention of a disease which has its source in the somatic cells, such as blood, bone, nerve cells, or cells specific to solid organs. 
Type 1 therapy is limited in scope to the specific individual receiving the therapy. Type 2 is also therapeutic. It is gene genetic engineering that is directed to the cure and prevention of disease that has its locus in the germ cells, the gametes essential for reproduction. This type of therapy has the potential to affect not only the individual, but future human beings, offspring born of the person whose genetic cells are modified. Type 3 and type 4 are not, strictly speaking, therapy. They are attempts to manipulate genes in order to enhance desired capabilities or desired traits. Type 3 is somatic cell gene enhancement. The effect of the manipulation is limited to the individual. Type 4 is germline gene enhancement. It has the potential not only to affect the individual but future generations and, as, and at its farthest reach, the uh, possibility to, to alter the human species. While much of genetic engineering remains a promise, there has been some success in type 1 somatic cell therapy. In 1990, a four-year-old girl who suffered from a rare genetic disease, severe combined immune deficiency, SCID, became the first patient to undergo gene therapy. SCID is caused by the absence of an enzyme required for the proper function of the immune system. People suffering from this disease are required to live a restricted life in a sterile environment. Recall, if you will, David the Bubble Boy. Physicians from the National Institute of Health used a vector to insert autologous lymphocyte cells, cells taken from the patient herself, with the desired gene that produces the enzyme adenosine deaminase to compensate for the defective gene. The corrected lymphocytes were returned to the child by intravenous infusion. The child was being treated with PEG-ADA, a version of the ADA enzyme, but this treatment was not sufficient to restore her immune system to desired levels. The new treatment was successful, and it, in combination with PEG-ADA, was continued for the child. With her immune system strengthened, she was able to attend school. Four years after the inception of this new protocol, the child weathered chickenpox with no more difficulty than that experienced by any other child with chickenpox. The successes were, this success was followed by the development of gene markers and gene protocols. Within five years of the first treatment of a patient with gene therapy, there were more than 100 protocols either up and running or in process of review. The use of recombinant DNA techniques to treat diseases involving missing or impaired, or impaired genes seems unproblematic. Its use to treat such diseases as skids, cystic fibrosis, types of anemia, some types of cancer, seems an appropriate human good and an intervention that allows human beings to exercise a providential role in the created world. It appears to be little different from any other curative measure practiced in medicine. And it may offer better options for patient who's, patients who suffer from severe illness. Cystic fibrosis pr provides a clear example of the potential benefit of somatic gene, gene cell therapy. As the disease progresses, lung transp transplantation becomes the treatment of last resort. If lungs are available, a very big if, the patient is required to undergo an invasive surgical procedure and is required to ingest immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of a lifetime. A further and not inconsequential aspect of the lung transplantation is the considerable cost. It is hoped that as somatic gene cell therapy advances, it will prove to be less invasive, it will be immune to rejection, it will be cost effective, and finally it will cure or regulate the disease to permit normal or close to normal human function. While the development of somatic gene cell therapy presents great hope for those suffering from severe disease, there also lies the possibility of an unanticipated consequences. A graver physical danger might be the eventual outcome rather than the good hoped for. So careful risk-benefit analysis must be considered. With this possibility in mind, 
great care must be taken that the approved steps in developing therapeutic medical treatments be carefully adhered to and that there be no rush to embrace miracle cures. Another possible danger lies in the current reductionism that is a consequence of too narrow a focus on a single gene. The risk here is the potential failure to understand how genes operate in relationship to other genes and in relationship to the whole person. A final concern here is that of the distribution of therapy. Because it is therapy, not research or enhancement, its end is to serve sick people. Procedures for, distribu for distribution must aspire to be just and must be public. With these caveats in mind, it seems appropriate to go forward with the additional caution in regard to possible harms which lie in the potential to misallocate the energy of science and the resources that medical science has available for medical relief. The excitement of the newfangled thing, the WOW technology, can be the occasion of forgetfulness of the need to supply basic medication for those in need, such as the vaccination of the children of the world. Type 2 therapy, germline therapy, has not yet been performed because of its complexity and because of the serious ethical issues involved. The risk of type 2 germline genetic therapy lies in its potential effects on future generations. The unlocking of the anatomy, both mapping and function of the human genome, combined with sophisticated assisted reproductive techniques, would allow for a new level of genetic screening, genetic diagnosis, and genetic treatment. These effects could be bad and they could be good. A possible good effect is the cure of disease or defect in the individual and in subsequent offspring. The possible deleterious effects are all the same as those listed for somatic gene therapy. However, an additional possible bad effect may be the destruction of nascent human life if the screening is done after human life has begun. The direct destruction of defective genes is not problematic. The direct destruction of defective human beings is problematic. Type 3 and type 4 are not, strictly speaking, medical interventions. They are human desires for enhancement of some characteristic or trait. Now, the enhancement itself is not problematic. Think of the ways human life is, enha is enhanced in the contemporary world. Better nutrition has made us stronger and combined with disease control has increased the span of our lives. Vitamins, even before birth, delivered through the mother, uh, give human beings a healthy start in life. Laser, laser surgery to improve vision is eliminating glasses for many of us. On the other hand, we tend to express disdain for those whose athletic performance were enhanced by chemicals. We tend to judge them unfair. So we draw lines, and we ought to draw lines. But when we draw lines, we must be able to defend the placement of the line. That is, it must be for important reasons, such as grave harm or uncertainty for the future or misuse of resources. In a developed and affluent society in which choice and power to affect that choice control the direction of science and technology, some of the concerns are the reason for enhancement, the degree of the enhancement, and the means of the enhancement. In developed and developing nations, there is a normal progressive progression of enhancement of human life and of human living. The normal progression can even be designated natural. One such measure of this progression is the Flynn effect, the progression of IQ over time. The studies by James Flynn, taken from a, a variety of sources from 20 countries over 60 years and supported by significant and reliable data, shows steadily increasing IQs. If there is a natural progression of improvement, might it be possible to use that as a model to guide enhancement, an incremental progression of enhancement? The important concerns in regard to genetic enhancement, in addition to why, to what degree, and by what means, are concerns for the distribution of the good of the enhancement, the direction of financial resources toward enhancement and away from cure, Think, for example, of the millions of dollars spent in developed nations on cosmetic surgery. 
and the possible change of perception of normal versus disabled human beings, with the consequence of increased discrimination against those who are not enhanced and decreasing sensitivity toward those who are perceived as less than perfect. Type 4 germ cell genetic enhancement has all of the potential problems as somatic cell enhancement and the additional risk of made-for-order children and the additional risk of the destruction of those who are examined before birth if they do not live up to the specifications. Every year when I teach the issue of gene therapy and gene enhancement, my students raise the question as to what human emotion might be lost if there were no persons with disabilities to draw forth sympathy, compassion, and finally love. What kind of society might we have then? An important question to ponder indeed. In response, I always ask them if they had a child with a disability and they had the opportunity to correct that disability, would they? And there the issue is joined. Let's turn now to genetic testing and genetic screening. Developments in genetic testing and screening coupled with possible new genetic therapies to cure defects or, e or illness hold out great promise for human beings. But as with all human progress, there is also possibility for abuse. First, there is a distinction to be made between genetic testing and genetic screening. Genetic testing refers to the determination of genetic status of a particular individual, whereas genetic screening is the application to a population. Genetic screening is not new. Its first application was the development of a test for phenylketonuria, an error in the, in the metabolism of phenylalanine that unless treated by diet restriction results in mental retardation. PKU testing is essentially testing for the presence of a disease or a disability in a situation where there is a relatively simple way of ameliorating the condition. Since then, the advances have been rapid. There are at least 10 genetic disorders for which newborns are routinely screened. The ethical requirements are the following. There is a clear indication of benefit for the child. There is a system in place to confirm to confirm the diagnosis and the treatment for the disease is available. Genetic testing wedded to reproduction is now becoming routine for those considering reproduction, especially for those whose medical history or genetic background indicates an increased risk. Three types of testing are now available. Carrier testing, testing of the pre-implantation embryo, and in utero testing. Carrier testing is an evaluation of prospective parents before conception to evaluate the likelihood of conceiving a child with a particular disease. Some population groups and communities who are susceptible for serious inherited disease, such as uh, Eastern European Jews who have a high incidence of Tay-Sachs, encourage testing before marriage to alert men and women who would be parents of the potential risk for children. Evaluation of the pre-implantation embryo is part of the process in in vitro fertilization and is done prior to the transfer to the uterus of the woman. In utero testing, such as ultrasonography, amniocentesis, photoscopy, and chorionic villi sampling is used to evaluate the condition of the fetus. Genetic evaluation combined with counseling affords the couple the opportunity to know and to understand the risks for the child they might conceive. It allows a couple to make a prudential judgment as to whether or not the possible harms for the child are greater than the benefit of existence for the child. Evaluation of the pre-implantation embryo or the fetus by any means available allows for the possibility of treatment prior to birth if treatment is available or allows the parents to make plans for appropriate treatment if their child has a problem for which there is a medical remedy at that time, or allows the medical team, which will care for the mother and child, to prepare for the problem that might attend the birth of the child, or allows the parents to rejoice in the knowledge that their child is well as they wait in, in joyful anticipation in the expectation of a safe birth. Evaluation of the pre-implantation embryo an evaluation of the fetus that permits the destruction of the embryo or the fetus 
is an act of directly killing a vulnerable, developing human being. The fact that the killing is done in a hospital by those whose profession commits them to protect human life and done with the consent of the mother or the mother and father does not change the nature of the act. Genetic testing of children for the possibility of genetic disease presents a particularly difficult decision. The ethical principles that have been operative in the testing of newborns provide some guidance here. The difficulty is compounded when the child is asymptomatic and when there is no cure for the disease and or no amelioration of its course. In general, genetic testing should not be done on children unless there are serious reasons for the testing. Symptoms of illness or familial history of a treatable disease or cogent reasons for limited testing. Pre-symptomatic testing of children for diseases such as Huntington's chorea, whose clinical manifestations occur later in life and for which there is no cure ought not to be pursued. At this time, the risk-benefit ratio is simply too great. Despite pleas of parents for the information as a way of preparing for the child's future, the clinical observations of the social and psychological risks for the child are simply too grave. The future of any human being is not guaranteed. The child, upon achieving adulthood, may choose, for serious reasons, to have the information as a way of planning for their own life or for marriage and children. Genetic testing of adults has a set of potential burdens and benefits that must be weighed carefully. Among the potential benefits are knowledge of diagnosis or risk, intervention for, preven for, for prevention or treatment, risk for members of the family, guidance for reproductive decisions, and facilitation of economic planning decisions. Among the potential for harm are psychological and emotional harms, economic harms, including the exclusion from insurance and employment, stigmatization, and serious social harm, and serious physical harm. In summary, genetic testing should be, should be done only when there are compelling reasons for the testing, only when the burdens to benefit ratio is favorable, and only after careful scrutiny of the vulnerability of the person in the case of serious negative consequences, and only if there is a caring and compassionate, well-formed family or network in place.